speed. Uh, are you taking a picture? <laughs> depend on everything except the Lord. I heard A.W. Tozer say years ago, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of this world, most of what is going on would go right on in the church and nobody would know the difference. But I don't think that's true here. I think that people sense that the Spirit of God is at work. Now I'm going to read perhaps the second most familiar parable that our Lord ever gave. Uh, I think the first is probably the prodigal son. The second is the one we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now you may wonder why read that at a 50th anniversary celebration uh, luncheon, but allow me to read it. Then I'm going to explain why I'm reading it. And uh, we're going to try to get some spiritual uh, encouragement from it. So shall we hear the Word of God? If you have a Bible uh, in any language, uh, it'll be in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Now, let me pause to say this. Our Lord was not saying that we're saved by keeping the law. Rather, he pointed to the law because by the law is the knowledge of sin. And until I am first of all convicted by the law, I cannot be saved by grace. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Obviously, he wasn't doing that, and nobody can do it by themselves and your neighbor as yourself. I think it was Chesterton who said, uh, God has commanded us to love our enemies and our neighbors because usually they are the same people. <laughs> uh, I hope that isn't true in your neighborhood. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. Well, of course, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. But he wanting to justify himself. Now that proves he couldn't do it. Nobody can be saved by keeping the law. We have to be saved by faith in Jesus. But he willing to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now we learn that as children. You know, mother says, clean up your room. You say, uh, what do you mean by clean? <laughs> When we were in debating squad in high school, that's, that's the way you silence your, uh, your opponents in debating. You know, define your terms. Okay, what do you mean by, who is my neighbor? Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, 
and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, as you know the Levites were sort of assistant priests, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Now, as we know, the Samaritans were the enemies of the Jews, and the Jews were the enemies of the Samaritans. John chapter 4 says, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, which of course is an understatement. Uh, forgive me, ladies, but uh, many of the Orthodox Jewish men back in this day would get up in the morning to say their prayers and they would pray like this, O oh Lord, I give thanks that I am a Jew and not a Gentile or a hated Samaritan. They would pray that the Samaritans would not be raised in the resurrection. God forbid that a Samaritan would ever go to heaven. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two pence, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. This man must have had a very good reputation for the innkeeper to uh, accept that. So, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. As I read this story, did you notice that there are illustrated in this story four different philosophies of life? Now, everybody here lives by some philosophy of life. Now, if you don't like the word philosophy, use the word outlook, attitude, values, but everybody lives by some philosophy of life. If you ask a, a teenager on the street who is... Uh, peddling dope, why are you doing this? He, he will say, I believe. He's got a philosophy. I believe. Uh, you stop somebody who, we just had a situation in, in Nebraska where uh, a girl stabbed a person, and you ask her, now why did you do that? Well, I believe. Everybody has some philosophy of mind. Everybody. It may not be clear, it may not be logical, but everybody has some philosophy of life. And so, in this story, four different philosophies of life are illustrated. And everybody here uh, follows one of these philosophies. Let's start with the thieves. The road that led from Jerusalem down to Jericho was a very dangerous road. Years ago, the Blackwood Brothers Quartet, whom some of you remember, uh, used to sing about the Jericho Road. Remember that? Uh, on the Jericho, you remember? We're both dating ourselves now, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> on the Jericho Road, there's room for just two. Well, there were thieves on that road. And uh, it was a dangerous road. Now, here comes a man, here comes a man down the road. He's just an innocent man. He, he, he's on his, on his way to Jericho. And the thieves take one look at him, and their philosophy is this. What's yours? is mine, I'll take it. That's the philosophy that pretty much runs our world. What's yours is mine, I'll take it. That's what starts wars. That territory that's yours is mine, I'm going to take it. That's what leads to thievery and murder. You see, you have in the universe God, he's eternal, God, people, God made people in his own image, and things. Everything in this universe, God, people, things. Now God is to be worshipped, people are to be loved, things are to be used. 
But that whole scenario has been twisted ever since Genesis 3, and now people worship things and use people and ignore God. Things are important, the most important. Uh, among those things, money. What's yours is mine. I'll take it. That's why we have jails and prisons. That's why we have court systems. And it's not doing a great deal of good, but we're glad we have some of that. Because there are people in this world who say, hey, I'm going to take it. Now the second philosophy of life you find here is the philosophy of the priest and the Levite. And at first it may look as though they are not as bad off, but when you think about it, their philosophy is, is a wicked philosophy. Here's the man lying half dead. He's been stripped, he's been robbed, he's been bruised, he's bleeding, he's lying there. And um, here comes the priest and goes by on the other side. Here comes the Levite, looks at him, goes by on the other side. Their philosophy was, what's mine is mine, I'll keep it. Uh, Betty and I had a friend who was a mortician, which is a very, nothing wrong with being a mortician, it's a very um, noble profession, be, be an awful thing to die and have to walk the streets, you know. You know. <laughs> and um, I had a number, of, a number of funeral services at his establishment. He's the only mortician I ever met in my life that I can remember, who came in and sat down with the family and listened to the sermon. Most of them were off watching television or, or and they're busy, they're busy people, you know. Very busy. But this friend of mine was downtown going to the bank where he was a bank director, I believe, and he had some kind of a seizure his heart or something and he he was on his hands and knees on the sidewalk next to the building trying to get his breath and a little lady came walking by and looked at him and said young man you'd better take care of yourself that was a big help, a big help. Now you'd think that two religious leaders, a priest and a Levite, would have done something. There were about 18,000 priests and Levites ministering in the Temple of Jerusalem. They had worked out a system so that about 300 of them a week went down and did their service, and they went back and they were through for the year. Strong union. <laughs> And you would have thought that a priest who is trained in the Old Testament law, and the Old Testament law teaches love your neighbor. The Old Testament law says, hey, if you find your neighbor sheep or oxen or animal straying, and even if he's your enemy, you take that animal back to your neighbor. The Old Testament law taught kindness. And you'd think the priest would have said, oh, man. Look at this stuff. He needs help. But he did what we like to do. We make excuses. Billy Sunday called an excuse the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. That's a good definition. Now, okay, you're the priest. You're the priest. And you say, boy, I really should help that fellow. But suppose that this is bait. Suppose those thieves are hiding out there, and the minute I turn my back and start to help him, they jump on me. It's not sensible for two people to get killed on this road today. I better keep going. That's reasonable. Or he could have said, like we so often say, well, I've done my work. I mean, I, I've been at the temple all week, and I've been taking care of the sacrifices and helping the people. I've done my work. Let somebody else do it. Ever heard that? Here, my Lord, send Aaron. <laughs> or he could have said, um, 
It's not my fault. It's not my fault. Um, am I my brother's keeper? Now, don't ever quote that because that comes from a man who, who was a child of the devil. Cain. So the priest had his excuses, and he passed by on the other side, and then along came the Levite. And the Levite could honestly have said, well, the priest didn't do anything, why should I? Or the priest could have said, I know the Levite is behind me a half a mile, he'll take care of him, but he didn't do it. We go through life saying what's mine is mine, I'll keep it. And the Bible teaches very clearly, what you keep, you lose. What you give, you keep. He who saves his life shall lose it. He who loses his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. What's yours is mine, I'll take it. What's mine is mine, I'll keep it. And they did, they kept it, but think of what they lost. They lost an opportunity to help a fellow person. They lost an opportunity to honor God by taking care of someone made in the image of God. Ah, but you say he was a stranger. It makes no difference. In the matter of compassion, there are no strangers. Well, maybe he didn't deserve it. In the matter of compassion, it's not a matter of deserving. We do what is right. They missed an opportunity. There's a third philosophy here. It's the philosophy of the lawyer. Now, remember, the lawyers in the Bible are not like lawyers today. Lawyers today have been bashed something fierce. There may be some lawyers here, but I don't know. Uh, preachers have to listen to these awful preacher jokes, and now the lawyers are having to listen to all these lawyer jokes, you know. Tombstone that read, Here lies a lawyer and an honest man. And the fellow says, Why are there two corpses in this grave? You know. <laughs> now that's nasty. That's just, that's nasty. I would never tell a story like that. <laughs> what was the lawyer's philosophy of life? What's yours is yours. Let's discuss it. <laughs> Let's discuss it. Now Jesus said to this man, Hey, you want, to, you want to have eternal life? Let's start with the law. Oh, okay. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, okay. Oh, who's my neighbor? See, whenever somebody doesn't want to be honest with you, they start talking like that. Let's discuss it. One of the best ways to get nothing done is to call a meeting and discuss it. Do you ever notice that? Now, it's important for boards to get together and discuss things, for committees. Uh, committees are a group of people who individually can do nothing and collectively decide nothing can be done. <laughs> nothing wrong with discussion, but there comes a point at which we have to quit discussing and start doing something. <laughs> I enjoy the life of D.L. Moody. I pastored Moody Church for seven years, and I just had a great time hearing the little stories about D.L. Moody. My predecessor, George Sweeting, is an expert on D.L. Moody stories. My favorite took place in Indiana, I'm a Hoosier. Uh, I was raised in northern Indiana, where on a clear day you could see your feet. And uh, <laughs> D.L. Moody was in Indianapolis, Indiana, at a YMCA conference. And uh, he got a hold of Ira Sankey, his song leader, and he said, Sankey, uh, get up on that box and start singing. He was on a street corner in Indianapolis. I knew you'd do that eventually. <laughs> <laughs> the cheap bulb you've got it burned out. <laughs> So Iris Sankey went and got himself a soapbox and got up on it and started to sing. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the king? And a crowd gathered out in the street corner, a crowd of men on their way home from work with their, with their lunch buckets. And, and Moody led this crowd down the street to a theater, an empty theater, 
they went in and sat down, and he got up to the platform and preached to them. Preached the gospel. And then he pulled out his watch and looked at it and said, I'm sorry, we have to close this meeting because in 10 minutes they're going to have a conference in this building on how to reach the masses. <laughs> now let's have a conference on how to reach the masses. Moody said, go ahead, have your conference. I'm going to reach them. Now this lawyer was a genius at evading the issue and avoiding responsibility. And some other people are like that. What's yours is yours. Let's discuss it. Well, who's my neighbor? Let's discuss neighborliness. Jesus said, no, let's talk about one man. Let's talk about one man. Let, let's pull it from the abstract down to the concrete. Let, let, let's get down to duty. Let's talk about one man who got beaten up and robbed and passed up. And uh, Let's talk about him. No, no, I want, I want to discuss who is my neighbor. When we were in university, we had to read philosophy. I still do read philosophy. It encourages me to read other things. <laughs> a philosopher is a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. And the trouble is, he finds it. <laughs> now, I read philosophy. I, 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 I want to learn all I can learn. But I know this much, you can discuss peace and never be a peacemaker. You can discuss neighborliness and never be a neighbor. Jesus said the question is not, who is my neighbor? The question is, to whom can I be a neighbor? That's the question. Another Moody story. This took place over in Great Britain. D.L. Moody called on a man to pray, I believe he was a pastor, and knowing that this was his golden opportunity, the pastor began to pray, and pray, and pray, and pray without ceasing. <laughs> and people were getting restless. You ever notice that most of the prayers in the Bible are short? You ever notice that? You can pray the Lord's Prayer meaningfully in two minutes. Anyway, a man, a man in the back got up and started to leave. He was a medical doctor. He did, he'd come to hear Moody. He had not come to hear some man pray, pray, pray around the world. And, and he was started to leave. And Moody noticed that this was happening. He got up and said, while our brother finishes his prayer, we will now sing hymn number so-and-so. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. The medical doctor stopped and said, I like that man. He's practical. I like him. I'm going to come back. And he listened to him. You know who that man was? Wilfred Grenfell, the great missionary to Labrador. God called him, sent him off on the mission field. Dio, but he was so practical. Let's not discuss neighborliness. Let's not be abstract. Let's get right down to helping people right where they are. What's yours is mine. I'll take it. That's not our philosophy. What's mine is mine, I'll keep it. That's not my philosophy. What's yours is yours, let's discuss it. No, no. There's, one four, there's a fourth philosophy in this story, and it's the one that we have to follow as Christians. It's the philosophy of the, of the Samaritan. He says, what's mine is yours. I'll share it. Now, the Samaritan is the last person you would have thought would help a Jew. I'm greatly concerned about the fragmenting of the American society. Back in the year 1912, when Theodore Roosevelt was speaking at a meeting, I wasn't there, but uh, <laughs> some of you could have been. <laughs> I read the speech, a great, great speech. He was talking about hyphenated Americans. Because they had German Americans, Swedish Americans, Irish Americans. He said, no, 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 we're Americans. We're Americans. 
And I notice we have a fragmented society today. In the city of Lincoln, Nebraska, if they're going to adopt a new textbook for the high school, certain groups in the city have to read that book and make sure it does not say anything negative about their group. It sometimes takes two and three years to get a textbook approved. Now, they've never said to me, uh, Where's, would you come over and see that this textbook is, is nice to the Swedes? Okay. I'm, I'm from Swedish background. They never asked that. For all I know, they made joke about my Swedish answer. That's all right. They were funny. That's all right. <laughs> my wife is Norwegian. Now, the Swedes and the Norwegians are not supposed to get along with each other. But we have for 43 years. And... Uh, I said to my wife, I said, you know, Swedish is going to be the language of heaven. Yeah. She said, I know. She said, the Lord knows the Swedes are too dumb to learn a new language. <laughs> you see, when you've been born again, you don't worry about that first birth. You really don't. Uh, you're, you're, you're not a Hispanic Christian or a Swedish Christian or a German Christian or a Canadian Christian. You're a Christian. Amen. And you belong to Jesus and we belong to each other. And our philosophy is, what's mine is yours, I'll share it. He, he came where he was. Didn't read about him in the newspaper or watch it on television. He came where he was. That's the hardest thing in the world to do. To come right where people are. To weep with those who weep. To bleed with those who bleed. That's the hardest thing in the world to do. Much easier to be up in an ivory tower with a telescope and watch him. Came where he was. And he had compassion on him. That was, the word for compassion in the New Testament is the word that means the whole of your insides are just turned over. You just feel it down inside, compassion. And he cared for him. He, for all he knew, those thieves were coming back. Aha, here's another one. But he poured in oil. That's the only medicine he had. He poured in wine to disinfect it. And... Uh, he cared for the man. And then he interrupted his own schedule. Now, it, it doesn't cost me much to give you an offering. But you ask for my time. You are asking for something very precious to me. Uh, all I have is time to give to God. If I've got a book to write or a sermon to prepare or something to do... And then the phone rings, and someone says, Brother Richard, can I talk to you about something? Well, have you talked to Minerith Meyer? No, I need to talk to you. <laughs> and sometimes you kind of look for the excuse not to get involved, and then compassion says, hold it, hold it, hold it. Jesus came where you were. And even more, he became what you were. And he had compassion on you, and he took care of you, and he saved you. And now he's given you life, and he's given you the word, and you've got to be able to say to other people, what's mine is yours, I'll share it. You see, everything we have came from God, everything, everything. If you have mechanical ability, you're one of these winter workers, and you know how to fix things and make things. God gave you that. He didn't give it to me. Boy, he sure didn't give it to me. I almost flunked woodshot. The other boys were making bookends and end tables and all kinds of wonderful wooden things. You know what I had at the end of a semester? A pile of shavings. <laughs> if you've got mechanical ability, God gave it to you. If you've got the ability to know how to make money, God gave it to you. He gives us the power to get wealth, says Deuteronomy. To teach, whatever ability you have, whatever means you have, God gave it to you. And God could take it away just like that. We're stewards. We don't own one thing. We're stewards. And so we really ought to be saying, what's mine came from God and it's yours and I'll share it. 
course, the ultimate example of that is the cross, isn't it? How could any of us go through life grasping and holding when Jesus opened up his hands and they put nails through them? Anybody who goes to the cross cannot, cannot go through life saying, what's yours is mine, I'll take it. What's mine is mine, I'll keep it. What's yours is yours, let's discuss it. No, no, you've got to be able to say, what's mine is yours, I'll share it. 63 years ago, I would have been uh, three years old. 63 years ago, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States. 63 years ago, this month, would have been on March the 4th. He made a declaration, a, an official presidential declaration of what he called the good neighbor policy. Do any of you remember about the good neighbor policy? When I was in grade school, we used to get a weekly paper called the Weekly Reader. They have one now for gardeners called the Weekly Weeder, but this was the Weekly Reader. And uh, it, in it was in big type so little kids could read it, was the news. And so often in the little Weekly Reader we got at school was news about the Pan-American Union and the Good Neighbor do any of you remember any of that? Sure you do. Now, what was a good neighbor policy? Well, it was this. For, for decades, there had been tension between the United States and our southern neighbors. I mean, real tension. And Mr. Roosevelt said, this is going to end. We want you to know we have no evil intents. We're not going to invade. We are going to be good neighbors. I haven't been there in a little while, but I used to be able to see the Pan American Union building in Washington, D.C. I think it's still there, and maybe it's still functioning. This is the great good neighbor policy. Now, here's where we're going to end. As I thought about this, I said to myself, you know, you folks here have been carrying on the greatest good neighbor policy in history. You have been like these Samaritan. What's mine is yours. I'll share it. You have been training ambassadors of peace. You have been broadcasting. You have been publishing. You have been teaching. You have been evangelizing. The greatest good neighbor policy for our good southern neighbors is coming and so when we pray, we're praying for the good neighbor policy. When we give, when we share, when we work, it's a part of what Paul called the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus Christ died on a cross, and a cross is a plus sign. The cross brings together. It brings sinners together with a forgiving God. And it brings all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds together in the body of Christ where there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female or Swedish or German or whatever. We're all one in Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? We're part of what God tells us in this parable. We're a part of a great good neighbor policy. I have to keep reminding myself as I get older that what's mine is not mine. John the Baptist said a man can receive nothing except it's given to him from heaven. Paul wrote and said, what do you have that you didn't receive and why do you act as though you did? What's mine came from God. That's yours. I'll share it.
Because when you give, it's given to you, and it's more blessed to give than to receive. You believe that? Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. He came where we were, and He became what we are. And now, one day, we shall be what He is. Hallelujah. Deliver us from the wrong outlook on life. If we protect, we'll lose. If we defend, we'll lose. If we share, we'll gain. And you will be glorified. Continue to bless the outreach of this ministry. And may its philosophy, O oh God, always be what's ours, God gave us. We'll share it. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.